is the highest form of flattery. But if there is anything higher than that and more important than flattery in itself is to find the true power of being you. Yeah, yeah. Why be a cheap copy of a great original when you have the option to be yourself? So, when you're starting to preach, people say, be yourself. Mm -hmm. Be yourself. But when you're first starting to preach, yourself sucks. Like, not as a human being, but as a preacher. Mm -hmm. It's true. <laughs> so then you hear, oh, don't imitate anyone else. But like, I, wanted, I actually wanted to start the conversation tonight because this book is a gift. And thank you for taking the time at this stage in your ministry to, sh to share this. I think it's so relevant. And I've, um, I've been waiting for this. You know, I think a lot of people have. Um, but I wanted to start not, not just talking about communication in general, but imitation. Okay. Right. Because imitation isn't always a bad thing, right? No. Well, okay. You want me to go past no. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no. Well, it's preached like it's a bad thing, like it's a well, spiritual danger. Let, let me explain what mentorship really means. It means that when Samuel grew up and was brought by Hannah into the house of Eli, he was unable to discern the distinctives between the sound of Eli's voice and God. That is the initial stage that God sounds like the person who mentored you. Gradually, you come to a point that the umbilical cord cuts and you have to go ahead to lay down the third time before he recognized that it was God talking and not Eli. And he says, Eli says, when you hear the voice again, go and lay down in the same place and say, speak Lord, thy servant here. So it is my job to gradually lead you from God sounding like me until you can hear that God sounds like God. You see, you see, and, and so that weaning process starts with him being weaned from Hannah, and now he is being weaned from Eli, that he might draw the breast milk from the breasted one himself, and thereby find the nutrition that he needs. The other thing that's important to realize is that we are looking at a generational uh, passing of the mic. Uh, from Eli to Samuel and and for Samuel can hear God but cannot discern him Eli has lost his ability to hear the voice but can discern it so there is say, say it again see, say, okay 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 look Eli couldn't hear the voice he was asleep okay Samuel, being the young people, could hear the voice, but didn't understand what to do with what they heard. Okay? We have a generation of people that can hear the voice, but they like the wisdom to understand what to do with what they hear. Eli, on the other hand, has lost his ability to hear his adventurousness. Uh, proclivity to step out into the unknown. He's playing it safe. His eyes are growing dim. His, his senses are decaying, but his discernment is still keen. So what, what Samuel needs from Eli is wisdom and discernment. What Eli needs from Samuel is the adventurous curiosity that allows him to hear the unhearable. Mm. This is all in the first seven minutes. <laughs> and what, what, it's so funny that you should bring it up because we are on the impetus of a transition now that is similar to the transition of days gone by. God said, I am going to do something through Samuel that is going to cause both the ears of them that hear it to begin to tingle. And he chooses to do it to a person who has yet to learn the confidence to hear the God that is going to do it through him. 
facts. So the promise of God is bigger than the reality of the individual. And he has to grow into it just like he had to grow into his mother's coat she brought up every year, not knowing for sure what size he would be. She, she makes the coat big enough that he can grow into it. And greatness must be grown into. Yeah. Okay. So when you're first starting out and you're preaching or you're communicating, because this book isn't just for preachers, right? Right. But we'll talk about preaching because we yeah. love to talk about preaching. Let's do that. I want you to know that, uh, by the way, my whole goal for this experience is for you to get a little bit of a taste of, like, this would be us on a Tuesday night <laughs> and three hours have gone by. and um. Bishop, this is what I wanted to understand about growing into it. When you're inspired by somebody, like the way I've been inspired by you, first of all, did you have somebody that you studied the way that I have studied you? I had several, and I still do. I, I listen at every orator imaginable. Whether I agree with the message or not, I watch for the delivery the technique and the style. You can learn from litigators. You can learn from comedians. You can learn from preachers. I know the content I want to deliver it, but the vehicle I want to drive it home in is, is a conglomerate of all of these different styles and the propensity. It's like asking a gospel artist, can you learn anything from a jazz artist? Can you learn anything from a classical pianist? Absolutely. And incorporate all of those different modalities into your style. And the more diverse those modalities are, the broader your stage becomes. So what are you listening for when you're listening? Ah. Uh, I'm listening at how they connect with the audience. Audience, I'm looking at how they enter the room. I'm listening at the rhythm. See, great preaching is almost musical. Great speaking has a rhythm. It has a cadence. It has a voice inflection and a tone. It has the ability to have a rhythm that is syncopated in such a way that the hearer can hear it in pace and in rhythm, so much so that if you start to speak and you draw the audience into the rhythm of the pace of the speaking through which you are conveying information, and then in the middle of the pace and the rhythm, you pause. The pause is what I call the pregnant pause. It, it's what David calls Selah in the Psalms. It is a moment for them to ingest, digest, and appropriate what has been spoken before. And sometimes the exclamation of the importance of the statement is the silence that you let it ride in on. D does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and most young preachers are afraid of the silence. Why? So they, they run to make noise because they need the affirmation that the crowd is still there. But you have to have enough confidence in the material that God has given you that, the, that it will do what it was created to do. And the Word of God does not need crutches. And to those that are litigators and prosecutors and those are, who are running for election and those who are applying for a job, truth needs no crutches. If it is true, it is true. And the human ability to sense truth is utterly amazing. It is, it is not just the verbalization of paragraphs and the conglomerates of chapters. It is, we hear with more than our ears. We hear with our eyes. We hear through body language. We hear through voice inflection. We hear through pitch and tone. This is what's wrong with marriage, is that sometimes your mouth is saying something, but your body language is saying something else. 